Hey, it's Darius. And every day I'm on the CPA exam Facebook groups answering candidates' questions about FAR, audit, BEC, reg. So if you're a member of any of these groups, like the Amazing Women of I-75, or, or this group here, here's another one of my favorite Facebook groups, Fearless CPA Exam Group. This group is growing really fast, run by a phenomenal woman. And I'm a member of all these groups, so if you want, just go on the group, ask a question. You can tag me if you want, I'll answer your question. The other day I was on this Facebook group here and somebody asked a question about operating lease rules and that's what gave me the idea to make a YouTube video on the new operating lease rules because they can be confusing at times. And if I could save you and other CPA candidates hours of frustration, well, that's probably why I'm up to 115 LinkedIn recommendations received from CPA candidates just like yourself who started out with Becker or Glime, or Surgeon, or Wiley, tried Ninja, Roger, and they just couldn't get over the top. So they hit me up and they said, hey Darius, I need you to do for me what you've done for so many others. So after I got them on I-75, put them on the right road, they passed, and they were excited to come back and share their story with you. So what is it that you should know about the new operating lease rules? I think of the new lease accounting standard I think of the term faithful representation from the accounting framework, the FASB framework. Remember that term faithful representation, which is one of the primary characteristics of useful financial information. Well, the whole idea behind the change to the leases rules back in 2018, FASB decided to change the leases rules because they wanted a more faithful representation of the lessee's rights and the lessee's obligations arising from signing a long-term lease. Because under the old rules, if a lessee had a long-term lease, a lease of a year or more, they didn't always have to include that lease obligation on the balance sheet. And FASB thought that just was not a faithful representation because if you can leave out a liability, and the way FASB looked at it, they said if a company could sign a long-term lease and choose not to put it on the balance sheet, then that's engaging in a practice known as off-balance sheet financing. And they didn't like that. So with the new lease rules, if a lessee signs a lease for greater than 12 months, that liability has to be on the balance sheet. Whether it's an operating lease or a finance lease, doesn't matter. Under the new lease rules, that obligation must be shown on the lessee's balance sheet as both an asset and a liability if the lease is greater than 12 months. And the driving force behind that change is a more faithful representation of the lessee's rights and obligations arising from signing a long-term lease. So there's now something known as a short-term lease, which is less than 12 months. And what you do as a lessee is you recognize expense monthly as time passes. So you simply debit expense, credit cash, each month that a payment is made. So it's a short lease, it's less than 12 months. Maybe you rent a short house for the summertime from Memorial Day to Labor Day. And each month you have a payment, you debit the expense, you credit the cash. Do not record an asset or a liability at lease inception if the lease is less than 12 months. But then we move up to an operating lease where the lease is more than 12 months, but doesn't rise to the level of a finance lease, which we'll talk about next time. An operating lease is going to be the subject of this video where the lease lasts for more than 12 months and under the new rules the lessee has to show the asset and the liability on the balance sheet which is the brand new rule because before this under operating leases you didn't show an asset and a liability on the balance sheet for an operating lease but now you have to which means all leases greater than 12 months the lessee has to show
an asset and a liability on the balance sheet. The asset's called a, quote, right-to-use asset, and the liability is called a lease liability. So we're doing operating leases, and brand new, you got to show the asset and the liability on the lessee's balance sheet. And the reason why this changed was because FASB hated the idea that you'd have a company in a long lease several years, and they didn't have any liability on the balance sheet. And if you were reading financial statements of that company, you wouldn't know that they even had an obligation to make monthly payments. Unless you were looking at the cash disbursements journal, you wouldn't even see the payment. But now, you could just look at the balance sheet, and you'll see the lease there. You'll see it on the balance sheet under liabilities. You'll see it on the balance sheet under assets. So what it means is, as we said as we started the video, the purpose of the new lease accounting standard is to have a more faithful representation of the lessee's rights and obligations. All right, so let's start with our first example of operating leases under the new rules. There's not going to be an immediate first payment, but we're going to see how we record the asset and the liability on the lessee's balance sheet on day one. So on January 1st, 2018, Johnson leased equipment from Pace Leasing for five years. The asset cost Pace $40,000 and should last 10 years. So what we have here is a five-year lease of a 10-year asset. And based on what we know about the criteria for leases, that doesn't meet the 75% test. So it looks like it's going to be an operating lease. Five years out of 10, only 50%. Each annual payment is shown at 7898.54 with the first payment due, not today, but a year from now on 1231.18. So we're going to use the present value of an ordinary annuity, not an annuity due, to calculate the total minimum lease payment. So it tells us the annual payment. It tells us that it's due at the end of the year. Today's the first day of the year. What about the interest rate? Well, it gives us the rate. The implicit rate is given at 7%. They tell us both parties are aware of the rate. And then they give us the present value factor for an ordinary annuity at 7% for five years, 4.1. If the lease is to be accounted for as an operating lease, they tell us, here's the journal entry for the lessee on day one. We're going to debit an account called right of use asset, and we're going to credit lease liability. And that faithfully puts the obligation right onto the lessee's balance sheet and records this asset known as right of use asset and the amount just by multiplying the present value of an ordinary annuity times the annual payment gives us the present value of the minimum lease payment 32384 now there's no immediate first payment being made today so no other entry is made on day one and there's no other entries made throughout the first year because there's no payment until December 31st 2018 so at the end of the first year that's when we're going to see another journal entry. So here's the T account for the right of use asset, debit balance, 32384 and that balance will carry all the way until year end. And same for the lease liability, that 32384 that beginning balance will carry all the way through year end. Why? Because there's no immediate payment on 1118. If there was an immediate payment, then we would be subtracting from the lease liability, but with no immediate payment, our year-end balance will be the same as it was on day one, as we get ready to make the first payment on 1231.18. Okay, now it gets a little tougher. We're at year-end, first year, 1231.18. Interest on the current lease balance of 32384 must be calculated. So we're gonna calculate interest. Are we gonna recognize interest? I don't know. Let's take a peek at the journal entries down below. I see a debit to lease expense, but I don't see a debit to interest expense. That's this first entry. The second entry, I don't see any expense. So we're going to calculate interest, but we're not going to recognize interest. And that's what makes operating lease a little tough because, yes, we have to calculate interest, but no, we're not going to separately recognize interest. Why? Because FASB decided that when they changed the lease rules for operating leases, they didn't want to change the income statement treatment, only the balance sheet. 
Remember, they were only interested in that faithful representation of the balance sheet, the liability. FASB was satisfied that there's a lease expense on the income statement under operating lease rules, that's good enough. When we get to finance lease rules, then you'll see for the lessee, there'll be interest expense separately recognized. But under operating lease rules, we're not going to have a separately appearing expense for interest, but we have to calculate interest. That's what makes this tough. So for interest to be calculated at 1231.18, the current lease balance of 32,384 multiplied by the 7% implicit rate given in the facts gives you 2267 of calculated interest. But if we look at the journal entry, we don't see any interest expense. We said that. Interest is not separately recognized under operating lease rules. The portion of the payment though, remember we're making a payment today, we're crediting cash for 7898.54, which is the annual payment. Well, the portion of the payment that doesn't represent interest represents principal. And that's gonna reduce not only the lease liability, but also the right of use asset. So notice what we just did. We calculated interest, why? so that we could determine principal. And once we know the principal, we can reduce the lease liability and the right of use asset by the amount of this payment that doesn't represent interest. Because the amount of a lease payment that doesn't represent interest must represent principal. And that's why we debit the lease liability by 5632 and credit the right of use asset by 5632. But there's no way we would have gotten that 5632 without first calculating interest on the lease balance. So we calculate interest, we don't recognize interest, we calculate it so we can determine the principal. Then we can reduce the lease liability by that principal portion. And we'll amortize the right of use asset by the same amount. Notice we amortize the right of use asset, but there's no separately appearing expense for amortization. There's only one expense for operating leases, and that's called lease expense, and it's the amount of the payment. Let's look at our T accounts now for the lease liability and the right of use asset. For the lease liability, we started with 32,384. There was no immediate payment on 1,118, but at year end, we had to calculate interest and then subtract it from the full amount of each payment, which once we did that, we got the principal amount of 5,632, we subtracted the principal amount of the payment from the lease liability, and that brought us to our year-end balance for the lease liability of a very important 26752 That's the balance of the lease liability at year-end, and they could easily ask you that on the CPA FAR exam. They could say, what's the balance of the lease liability at 1231.18 immediately after that first payment? So 26,752 is the balance of the lease liability. Let's look at the right of use asset T account. The right of use asset started with 32,384 also. We credited it for the same 5,632, the amortization. That's the principal amount also of the payment. And we're left with 26,752 as the ending balance of the right of use asset. So you may have noticed that when there's no immediate first payment, the right of use asset and the lease liability are together. The two amounts stay the same. They're together at the beginning of the lease term. They're together at the end of the year, right? Don't we have the same right of use asset balance, 26,752 at year end? Same as the lease liability, 26,752 at year end. Now, nothing happens on 1119, right? The very next day because there's no payment that day. In fact, nothing happens until a year later on 1231.19 the next lease payment is made. Once again, interest must be calculated on the current lease balance of 26,752. Your ending balance from last year becomes your beginning balance for this year. Take 7%, that's the implicit rate given in the facts, and there's your interest calculated for the second year, 1872.64. That means you're gonna reduce the principal by the amount of this payment that doesn't represent interest, and that comes out to 6,026. So for our two journal entries, we're gonna debit lease expense for the amount of the payment, just like we did last year, and credit cash. And then very important, again, we're gonna reduce the lease liability by the principal amount of that payment and credit the right of use asset for the same amount. And there's no way we could have gotten that 6,026 
without first calculating interest and then subtracting the interest for this year from the total amount of the payment. But we don't separately recognize the interest under operating lease rules, nor do we recognize an expense for the right of use asset. There's only one expense under operating lease rules, and that's lease expense. Let's look at the T accounts for the lease liability and the right of use asset. We'll see if they're still together. For the lease liability, 32384 to start, then the principal reduction at the end of the first year, and the principal reduction at the end of the second year brought us down to 20726 at 1231.19. And they could easily ask you that on the CPA FAR exam. How much is the lease liability at year end after that second payment was made? And it would be 20726 Now let's look at the right of use asset T account. Started with the same balance, 32384 We amortized it once for 5632 the principal amount of the payment. And the second time the amortization was for 6026 the principal amount of the payment. And then we wound up with 20726 the same balance as the lease liability. So when there's no immediate first payment, the right of use asset and the lease liability will always be together. If you found this operating leases video helpful, please like and subscribe. And if you were thinking about getting yourself on I-75, this might be the best time to do it. So go to cpaexamtutoring.com, get yourself on I-75, and take it to your next pass. I wish you a hopeful Christmas. I wish you a brave new year All anguish, pain and sadness Leave your heart and let your road be clear